I'm Matt Godbolt. And I'm Ben Rady. And this is Two's Compliment, a programming podcast. Hey Ben, we've spoken a lot about how important it is to have a fast feedback cycle. That's easier said than done in some languages. Um, I spend most of my time in compiled languages like C++, and they're well known for having really slow builds. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about how it might be possible to make our life easier and whether or not there are things we can learn from other languages or other approaches that you might know, or if there are like some tricky tricks that I know from C++ that I can we can talk about, to just basically try and give people an idea about how one might test or run or deploy your compiled language pro- project, or indeed any other language project, as quickly as possible and get that feedback, that rule of eights thing that we've talked about a number of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think that would be cool. It might be kind of important to talk about uh, when we say like feedback cycle. Like, what do we mean by that? Like, what are some examples of feedback cycles in software development? And, you know, how do you speed them up? So when I'm developing, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool IDE person, as you know, having worked with me. Mm -hmm. And I love being able to make a small change to my code and then very quickly find out where I've gone wrong. And very, very often, that is either the squiggly lines in the IDE itself, where it's where it worked out that, hey, you know, you've mistyped something, or maybe the green squiggly lines that, like, the linter has run and said, you know what, that's probably bad practice. Or mostly, it's I, I hit build, and very quickly, I get the result back from the compiler that says, you're a fool, you're missing a semicolon. You know, that kind of thing. So that's that's the first level of feedback that I'm looking for is, am I on the right track as a developer just on the nuts and bolts stuff about have I got my syntax right? Mm-hmm. But then once I've got something working and building, I want to know whether it's right. And, you know, we've talked a bunch about testing and that basically means running automated tests or indeed just running it and kicking the tires myself and saying, is this what I wanted? Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about feedback. I think... I'd like to go from the point where I've made a change in my code to seeing if it works, however we define that, as quickly as possible. Yeah. In fact, you know, there's kind of a model of software development where it's really nothing more than just a number of feedback cycles all increasing in length, right? From like typing the keys and seeing whether or not you got a syntax error to, you know, saving and maybe compiling and running tests to see if you have a logical error to starting up the system and maybe doing some manual testing or some integration, automated integration testing to see if you have a system level error, to, you know, giving it to a user and making it sure that the user got what they expected, Mm -hmm. deploying it, you know, you can kind of go further and further out. I guess, yeah, they're all part of the same thing. Each each is a little bit further down the line to the finished product than the last step. But if you think about it holistically, then you get, each of those is, it's important to be able to, to, to get too quickly like like deployment for example that's often right. something which is grafted on at the very very end and is a mm-hmm. massive pain if you're especially with uh, um, binary deploys like in a compiled language sometimes if you've got to deploy a particular build and it has certain dependencies that if you think about that at the end it can be a nightmare but if you start from the beginning then you're always deploying and it's not such a, a, a problem yeah I mean you can think of all of these things I think as sort of um, spending a little bit of time to get confidence that you are ready to spend a little bit more time, mm-hmm. right? Like, you you know, from a, from a very naive point of view, you, as, a, as a, you know, almost not a person not involved in programming at all, you could just say, well, why don't you just sit down and type out all the code from beginning to end exactly correct and then give it to me, right? Like right, right. In the, in the final finished form. And, you know, we obviously know as programmers that's not how it works. But, you know, it's it's maybe useful to think about, okay, well, specifically, why doesn't that work, right? Like, what do you actually right. need to do to, you know, deliver working software? And I think a lot of it is the recognition that it's, you know, I would say it's basically impossible to build large things correctly. You can only build large things out of small things and try to build the small things correctly. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, maybe there are 
the lines you draw between big and small can vary from person to person or team to team or problem to problem, but I think that's kind of mostly true. And so the feedback cycles are just a way to define small things and, and to try to buy a little bit of time by saying, well, I'm going to do some very, very small things and check that they're correct and then do some more small things and slightly bigger things and slightly bigger things. So builds are obviously uh, a big part of that. And, and right. how you set up those those feedback cycles is a big part of that. In a yes, particularly compiled languages, and let's face it, even JavaScript these days. When I'm hacking on my my hobby project, I spend most of my time waiting for Webpack to do its magic and you know mm-hmm. convert my TypeScript to <laughs> to yeah. JavaScript or do whatever. So like everything is compiled these days. Yeah. So there's definitely something to be said for getting that fast feedback cycle. Um, in in C plus plus in particular. I've worked on very large projects back a decade and a half ago when I was working on games industry. There were giant, giant megalithic projects that were very long to build. And mm-hmm. that made testing hard. It was a it was a big deal. You know, you would you would build the code, you'd go and make a cup of tea, you'd come back and hopefully it had actually built and linked, and then you'd deploy it to your through a serial cable to a like a dreamcast on the other end of it, and then you'd run it and you'd be like, oh crap. Yeah, I got that the wrong way around, didn't I? And that was bad. Nobody really wanted that situation. Yeah. And so um, actually inspired with uh, a colleague of mine at the time, uh, we started taking some approaches that uh, a guy called John Lakos, who now works at Bloomberg, uh, had come up with as like, these are principles by which I lay out structurally, physically lay out my software so that the build time is minimized. Mm-hmm. And that's a really interesting thing for me. That was a that for Nick and I, it was a real eye opener. That as well as designing software for testability, not that we really were at the time, but you know, right. as, as, but modularity certainly, yeah. and ease of understanding and separation of concerns. If only because then we knew that we could give this to Tim and then that to the other guy, and then you know we know that who's doing what right, and they right. aren't treading on each other's co- to- toes. But there was this idea of structurally designing your code. So that you laid out things to minimize rebuilds, particularly, mm-hmm. and these are some of these are very specific to C plus plus. Like those listening who aren't as, as familiar with C plus plus, you kind of have to repeat yourself twice in C plus plus in many many ways, where you declare something exists with a particular um, interface, be it just a function or an entire class and all of its contents, and then you can define what those things are somewhere else. And that's the header file and the CPP file. And there's a mm-hmm. huge blur between the two of them because you can put things in the header file that you could otherwise have put in the CPP file and vice versa. But the the real trick is that anything that's calling your code needs to see the declaration, i.e. it exists and it has this form, but doesn't care necessarily about the definition. It doesn't actually care what you're doing with it. It just says mm-hmm. there exists a function called printf. Hey, it takes a variable number of arguments. Good luck. And that's all you care about as a caller. Mm-hmm. But anytime you change that contract, anytime you modify, well, now it takes three parameters or two parameters, or it takes an integer instead of a double, all of the callers of your function need to be rebuilt in order to be updated to know that they have to change their calling convention or anything like that, things like that. And so the trick is to minimize the chance that you're going to be changing something that's a, a declaration in a header file so that mm-hmm. you don't force everything to rebuild. And so there are a number right. of tricks that you can do to do this. And, and Lakos's book, um, Large Scale C++ Design, I think is what it's called, was a huge eye-opener to, for, for us. And actually, we realized that a lot of, lot of these things could be automated. And we, when our then games company went down, uh, we founded a little <laughs> startup to try and make this a, a machinable thing, an automatic uh, uh, you know, set of, I guess what they would be nowadays is refactorings of an existing code base. We had yeah. a very different idea and it didn't work out, but that's a whole other episode, I think, about the failures of my <laughs> my, my startup business. But yeah. um, what it means is that there are ways of changing your code that sometimes are like just free. Like don't put stuff in header files if you can avoid it, right? right. Don't expose your in, inner workings to your consumers if they don't need to be up in your business right they don't mm-hmm. need to know that i'm um, uh, um calling some other function and of course there's a sort of transitivity issue here which is that if you are exposing your innards to another person and your innards use another library 
Now, right. the person who's including you is transitively including another library. And so C++ gets a bad rap for, for build times, understandably. Yeah. Well, I think it is one of the few languages where – well, actually, I don't know about the few. It is – uncommon among popular programming languages, I think it's a fair characterization to make, that the structure of your code has such a dramatic impact on your build. Like, I don't even think that you see that in other compiled languages. You definitely don't see that in, you know, non-compiled languages. I mean, the load time of, you know, a Ruby or a Python file is negligible compared to the execution time a lot of the times. Right. Um, um, and so even with something like Java, like you don't really think about those things, right? No, there's some magic behind the scenes and some like very quick pass over the Java files has generated enough un understanding of like, hey, this is what the module contains that you just don't mm -hmm. think about it. It's hidden away from you, but it's right. exposed right. warts and all to you in C++. And it's in many ways, it's a feature because yeah. in some cases, I do want to expose the, my deepest implementation to the outside world because – I'm I'm a generic uh, algorithm, and if I'm a generic algorithm gener genericized on some type that I don't even know yet, C++ decided to go down the route of effectively code generating with my algorithm and your type. You inject your type into my algorithm, and the compiler uh -huh. sees it and, and is able to do all sorts of amazing optimizations given that. And so it's a feature that the innermost part of my you know, binary search or whatever I've written generically is exposed to you so that when you put in your type that has a particular less than operator, the compiler can make a really good decision about how to, to optimize that. That's brilliant. That's great. And of course, if I do change the algorithm inside my, um, my, my binary search, of course you have to rebuild. I've changed how mm -hmm. it works and you will be able to optimize in a different way. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, um, I think a lot of, uh, I mean, just to take one simple example, it's really convenient as a, a C++ developer to put trivial functions into the header files of, of mm -hmm. say, a class. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing a class, you have a choice. When you declare a, uh, a function, you can also define it in place and just sort of actually open the squiggly braces and say, well, okay, this is return my member thingamajig right so then then um the implementation is in the header file too and that's great and it's super convenient because it's as a programmer right you don't want to be opening two files and keeping these things mm -hmm. in track and whatever yeah. so you, you might do that but now of course you have put your implementation in the header and so you've exposed yeah. it to other people which is fine now there are two reasons why you might do that one you're lazy and i'm very lazy all of the time so mea culpa <laughs> and two because Certainly in older generation compilers, it was the case that the only time that things could be inlined is if the compiler could see the body of a function, which again mm. makes sense, right? The compiler needs to be able to see what the function is doing, i.e. into its innards and having a look at what uh, actual operations are being done in order to make the determination about whether it should inline something and then ultimately to inline it. And as we know, sort of inlining is like the Uber optimization. Everything runs off inlining. You inline stuff, and then you notice that things are constant, and then you can delete huge areas mm -hmm. of code, and then you can inline some more stuff. And then before you know it, a huge complicated chain of things becomes like a simple operation. So inlining is something you definitely, definitely want to have available. So obviously, you want to put some things in the header file in order to say to the world, yeah, okay, you can inline my function. But now you're, you've got this sort of decision to make. Is the mm. performance important to me? Is it really important if it's a trivial uh, accessor, like, you know, I get, get something, um, then return something. You're like, well, it, it doesn't hurt me to do this. So I'm going to put it in the header file. Something I've seen that people haven't realized is that compilers have moved on. And now with link time co-generation or um, yeah, LTO, link time optimization, Compilers are able to do the inlining process even with things that they didn't at the point of compilation have access to. Mm -hmm. And so what I have started doing now is putting very, very few things in headers, very few things indeed, and relying on link time optimization when I'm doing my release builds, which does take longer. But I'm not caring about that, right? I'm, I, for for yeah, my yeah. testable builds, I really want it to build fast while remaining honest to this is what I'm going to ship. 
Yeah. So yeah. Th- there's a bit of a, a dichotomy there because obviously everything you do that's different b- between shipping and debugging um, that isn't the same is is maybe problematic or could be problematic down the road. But I found right. that like having a very tight turnaround in debug mode where I I uh, don't turn on link time code generation and I um, and I move everything out of the header files usually comes back as a as a boon for me Mm -hmm. so that means i can make changes you know hey i need to uh who all is accessing this thing i want to print out who's doing it or actually no i'm going to get rid of this um this field entirely and i'm going to replace it with a calculation well actually that maybe is a problem but anyway um now i can make those changes and then the only thing that rebuilds is my test the c file that it's um implemented in and then the linker has to churn and do some magic and and that's that's great yeah and then when i come to do my release build I turn on link time code generation and it's as if I had written it the the, the old fashioned way, the traditional way. Anything that could be inlined will be inlined if it's profitable to do so. Right. And right, so it's kind right, of the right. best of all worlds. Uh-huh. But what I definitely do when I do this is I make sure that I build and run my tests in debug and release in my CI. Which right. Is anathema to a lot of people. They're like, why on earth would you do this? Right. Just build it in debug. And I'm like, well, I am sort of sort of voiding the warranty a bit by saying um i'm trusting that the compiler's optimizations don't change the meaning of my code which i think at some point you have to do i think we've talked about this before programming is a faith-based activity at some level one has to trust the compiler yeah most of the time right you're going to spend a lot of time checking things that are already true if you don't have some level of trust somewhere exactly exactly so assuming that the compiler works you can get a lot of coverage by running the debug mode like day in, day out. But just to be sure, just to mm-hmm. be sure, and it's relatively low cost when you're doing a release candidate or something like that, you should run the the, the tests in release mode as well. And and a mo- mainly because um, it's not actually the compiler that will be at fault. Like 99 times out of 100, if you have a difference in the release versus the debug, it's almost certainly your own fault. C++ has plenty of traps for the unwary. Uh, if you're invoking undefined behavior, which is sort of dreaded, you're, you've gone off script from what the mm-hmm. language says you're uh, allowed to do, then in some cases the, the compiler is, is completely uh, able to, to do something very, very differently than you intended because you, you did it wrong. And, uh, yeah, that's, as yeah. an, and that typically it turns off in, in release builds when the optimizer sort of comes out. So... Mm-hmm. I guess that's just an example of one of the things that one can do uh, with a more modern compiler. And I mean, anything greater than like GCC 5, I think, has supported this. And, and actually, Microsoft's compilers have supported this forever. Right. And the magic here is really in the linker, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The linker, effectively, when you're doing this, your your builds only build with like an intermediate language. Mm-hmm. And then when the linker is invoked... As it's connecting the dots of this function calls this function calls this function, it's like, well, they're very abstract. It's just a, a dag almost of like what calls what. And then he goes, oh, I need to reify this function now. And I have the whole program visible to me. Now, it does mm. make for a slow link, of course. So that's another reason why you try to do this only in your release builds. Yeah, yeah, But it's, yeah. it's op- opens the door to making your your development cycle faster. Yeah. And I mean, certainly... You know, this fits very well with the model that we were just talking about in terms of, you know, doing those debugs as a a way to spend a little bit of time now to give yourself confidence that you can spend more time later, right? Like right. If the release builds, like, I'm inten- you're intentionally shifting work into the release builds and making them slower because it enables you to make some of those other feedback loops, the more frequent feedback loops, faster, right? Yep. And, you know, it takes maybe a little bit of in your head math to make sure that that makes sense. But it sounds like from your experience, that makes sense quite often. Um, I have to ask though, is, is the whole like running the tests on the release build? Cause you don't trust that it's exactly the same, something that's from hard one experience. Have you, have I'm, you seen I'm that? I'm afraid so. Yeah. I'm afraid so. Yeah. Well, I found, I've, I, I have found compiler bugs uh, before now in this instance, but as I say, 99 times out of a hundred, I've found cases where I was inadvertently relying on, undefined behavior mm-hmm. and i think it when one has spent 
a couple of decades doing this, you kind of build a mental model of what the compiler is allowed to do and the kind of optimizations it's allowed to do. And so you might, on purpose or otherwise, write the body of a function in a separate file um, and know that calling it from another CPP file won't be able to see, on forward, inverted commas, the, the sort of nasty trick that you're pulling in some other place. Mm-hmm. So the compiler, having compiled these two things separately, will do the right thing. But when it can see the whole program, it's like, oh, wait a second, you do this thing. Oh, I can throw that away then. You're like, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> you know, you were wrong. I was wrong as a programmer. I was wrong, definitely. I was relying on what was undefined behavior, but I was getting away with it which is a dangerous, dangerous world to live in. And I definitely don't want anyone listening to this to think that it's okay to rely on undefined behavior. It is not. It's definitely you're outside of the the warranty of the compiler, such as there <laughs> is one. But um, but yeah, it, it is hard one, unfortunately. And it's just worth doing. And I mean, of, oftentimes, if you're going to build, if you're going to build a release version to test, you can do like performance analysis as well. And, and that mm-hmm. seems like a worthwhile thing to have as a side effect. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you're kind of getting into a little bit of a whole release pipeline with that, right? Where, you know, again, it's this, this, these successive feedback cycles where it's like, I'm going to run my, my tests. I'm going to do my debug build. I'm going to run my tests. I'm going to do my release build and run test again. I'm going to do some performance testing. I'm going to deploy. I'm going to deploy to one server. I'm going to deploy to 10 servers. I'm going to deploy to 100 servers. I'm going to turn the feature flag on, whatever it is, right, Mm -hmm. to to sort of go through those progressions of more and more confidence that things are working. But, you know, you don't want to get to that point before you discover that you've, you know, flipped a sine operator somewhere or, (laughs) you (laughs) know, used a double equal instead of a single equal or whatever the the, the thing might be, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a, it's an intentional movement, moving of that cost to later only because the chances of it failing are lower, right? Right. Uh, there, there is like an optimal amount of time for a build to fail. It's not never, right? If your build literally never fails, why do you even have it, right? Like that's, <laughs> It's not giving you any new information. So you do want it to fail sometimes. Um, you just want it to fail the right amount of time for the, uh, you know, length of the feedback cycle, right? Uh, yeah. The longer feedback cycles should fail less frequently and the the shorter feedback cycles should fail more often it's worth saying that not every compiler supports this i know i said gcc 5 and plus uh do support this but the more unusual compilers for embedded systems won't support this feature the the link time co-generation stuff so maybe depending on your exact situation you might not be able to apply this all the time and in fact Mm -hmm. another thing that i have sort of internalized as a server developer as i am is that uh, my servers are so fast that even a debug version running on my computer runs tractably fast. And, you know, it can be 10, yeah. 20, 30 times slower than the release build, maybe even more. And that's still okay for me to run all my tests in, certainly the tests that I care about before I'll check code in. And that isn't yeah, always yeah. the case. If you're deploying or you're running tests on a system that is considerably slower or has timings to meet, then maybe uh-huh. you can't do that maybe you can't rely on the compiler working fast enough in release but Mm -hmm. i think a lot of people fall into the category of able to use these kinds of of tricks oh for sure and i mean you know one of the one of the actually great things about working in c++ is that as you've said you know you're probably choosing c++ for a reason and that reason is probably performance well, guess what? That means your tests run super fast if you write them correctly, right? right? Like, right. especially in comparison to a language like, you know, Ruby or Python or JavaScript or even Java uh, in some cases, uh, the tests can be extremely fast. So, you know, I sort of have this benchmark in my head, which I, I forget if I've mentioned before, actually, of like, you know, your test, you should be able to run hundreds of tests per second. Well, in C++, it's hundreds of tests per second averaged including your build time is kind of how i would say that because the actual test run should be like thousands of tests per second right 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 i mean test test systems are especially in debug are a bit slower than that for all the reasons we discussed and you know test Mm -hmm. frameworks like to try and capture as much information so when they ultimately fail so there's a bit of uh you know i would uh, i'd say it's, it's okay for them to only only run hundreds of tests a second i'd be surprised if my tests actually run that fast i'll be honest with you <laughs> i should check i haven't really thought to do it but 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it it definitely depends on the style of test that you write, and and I think that you can actually even sometimes get into a little bit of a of a broken windows thing. Well, maybe this isn't exactly broken windows, but it's you sort of fall into the trap of the speed of the code itself actually hides um, some not great testing techniques that you wind up doing. Like there's this sort of subtle interaction between tests that are brittle and tests that are slow, right? right. Tests that are brittle tend to do things like access databases and, you know, read and write files and communicate with services and do all these other things. And tests that are slow also tend to do those things, right? And so if you sort of listen to the speed of your tests... I don't know if that's a workable metaphor, but <laughs> if you <laughs> we'll go with it. if you if you pay attention to the speed of your tests, they can sometimes tell you when you've done some of that stuff inadvertently. Like I have definitely been in the middle of writing tests, and all of a sudden the test got really slow, and I'm like, "Oh, what's going on here?" I'm like, "Oh, well, I'm actually reading data from this service. That's why it's so slow. I need to yeah. knock that out." Yeah. Um, one of the other things I kind of wanted to ask you is is um, there is there's definitely you know you were talking earlier about you know, having in C++ having to sort of say things twice, right? Like there's this choice of like, do I put this in a CPP file or do I put it in a header file? And, you know, I think the, ca the case that you gave, it was, it was more obvious that you shouldn't be putting certain things in a header file. But I can imagine there are lots of situations in which that decision almost becomes arbitrary, right? Like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not I should be using templates or something like that is a decision that you might, you might make. Are there, are there ways to sort of frame those decisions in terms of faster feedback and faster builds where it's sort of like well normally you from a from one perspective these two solutions might be you know equal in dignity but from a you know build time perspective actually one of them is much better than the other that's a really good question um it's definitely the case that certain c++ features mandate you putting code in the header or almost mandate mm -hmm. it so you mentioned templates. That is uh, a, a great example where the generic programming almost always has to go into the header file because anyone who might reasonably use that that functionality needs the implementation of it in order to to optimize, like we talked before, or even instantiate mm -hmm. it, as mm -hmm. we said before. Um, another thing is uh, the compile time programming of const expr functions, which is a sort of new money <laughs> style uh, way of doing programming that um well to take a small diversion you know templates are in initially designed to be a generic programming tool and then very quickly it was discovered that um they were themselves the way that the instantiations were done and the way that the compiler res resolved certain features um, was itself turing complete so you can actually write a program purely using templates which is a meta program, a t program about a program. And that's a useful characteristic, it turns out. It's essentially like an in in uh in build uh code generator mm -hmm. of, of a sort. And you know, you can start doing all sorts of tricks with like, well, okay, I, I want to do this if the template type that I was passed is an unsigned, because I don't have to check now if it's negative, because it can't be negative, and therefore I can actually write my algorithm to take advantage of that mm -hmm. potentially. And then right? eventually you, you re-implement I mean, Lisp. And then, I mean, all languages re-implement this <laughs> eventually. And in fact, yeah, a lot of template metaprogramming looks like, uh, you know, all the consing and, and addering and all the weird lispy type terms come up. <laughs> so um, constexpr is another way of writing a much more imperative programmer-based metaprogram of a sort. It can be used in many other contexts too. But very often, again, that means that the program the functions that are context but have to be put into a header file because the compiler has to be able to see their their body in order to evaluate them mm -hmm. appropriately which is which is great you know but those two techniques if you start out as the as that being like i'm going to do everything that way you you basically don't have the option of pulling things into a cpp file without mm. extreme tricks and there are some tricky tricks for doing some of those things and i have definitely seen a modern style of c++ which i don't write just because i'm the way that i am i think you know it's the, my, my journey has meant that i'm much more of an imperative one line after another kind of programmer um and i use templates when they are profitable obviously profitable to me based on my sensibilities and context where i use as much as i can but usually it's not by default 
which means that a lot of my stuff is pushed into CPP files yeah, just yeah. because that's how I go. So I can make these statements about like, oh, yeah, just pull it into the CPP file and your bills go faster. Um, and it's very hard to be in the situation where you have a, a template-heavy piece of code and try and reduce the build time of it uh, just because there isn't anything to reduce in a way. So I guess the design of your system, and I, I suppose this comes back to Lacos's, uh, uh thing, you know, like actual physical design of your system has to be factored in when you're making high level design of mm-hmm. how you're going to fit your components together if you want to choose if you want to select for build time then that's something you need to consider earlier on yeah although in terms of some of the things that we've been talking about it occurs to me now that another sort of dimension is if i am in fact changing a template heavy piece of code let's say it's the binary search that we sort of i made up earlier so I'm editing the binary search and I want to make sure that I haven't broken it, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that seems no, – yep. no, no one's ever written a faulty binary search. I know it's a <laughs> trivial thing to get right. <laughs> Especially in interviews. Perfect every time. Every time, without fail. Uh, but you will have a test file for that almost certainly. And so now the way that your build system is set up contributes to how quickly you can iterate on did I break my binary search. Right. Because if you if your build system is like the sort of default go go to make or CMake or whatever, where you just sort of say make test, mm-hmm. it's going to run all the tests. And mm-hmm. if you've just touched binary search dot h, sure as heck, ninety seven percent of your code base needs to rebuild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for you to run the one test that tests it with you know ints and floats and doubles or whatever you've whatever your binary search test case is. And what you really really want to do is build just that one test yeah and run that one test right and that's hard to do in c++ because there's a lot of complexity in the way the build systems work Mm -hmm. and almost necessarily you group things in modules and then sort of treat them as as an atom and build and link that one library together and so in my own projects i tend to make one library per subdirectory and then i try and put minimal stuff in each subdirectory and then have a test for that like library and then branch out Mm -hmm. but it's not always possible to do that uh and i mean it's certainly the cases of some of the um like bigger code bases where everything's in everything else it may be hard to extract sensible modules which i think comes back to the design stuff we've talked about before where if you design for say testability and this is another metric that you measure testability by how isolated can i make this object and it's a tests at the build level, which again is like a physical property, not a conceptual thing. It's like, no, can I just type make binary search test or mm-hmm. go into my IDE and hit just that and know that I'm not even compiling the rest of the code? Yeah. That could be something to worth thinking about. I don't have an answer for that, but I you know, one 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 tries to to organize one's code as best as one can. I actually I do know uh, I have a, a an ex colleague who works for a, another um, uh, financial company, and he's looking, I think he's trying to open source it, a, a build tool that essentially starts from a test, a C++ build tool that starts from a test. You point at the test and say, can you run that test, please? And it kind of backs out the mm. build tree, sort of uh, by look for, following all the include files and, and working backwards and going, well, this is the minimum set of things I need to have built to be up to date in order for, to run that one test, which is... If he can open source it and if it works as well as he he's, he disca- described it to me, it would be a huge boon to yeah. be able to say, no, those tests, please. And there are some subtleties because, there's, of course, everything's more complicated in C++. You've got like global objects and all sorts of nonsense like that. But that kind of thing is maybe a sea change in the way – pardon the pun – in the way that we run <laughs> tests one's code if you can you can literally point it to that. And, and in fact, do refactorings. How many times in C++ have you gone, I really want to change this, this interface and – I want to test it with a subset of my my code, mm-hmm. but everything's broken now because I broke the interface and ninety seven percent again ninety seven percent of my code now fails to build, and I don't want to spend the time updating it until I'm sure that this is a right step for me to take. Right, right. and so I want to make sure my tests pass first, so that I haven't broken the intent of what I'm changing, and then I want to test like a subset of my code. Does it smell right? Does it feel right? Can I run the test? in that part of the code before I then commit to rolling up my sleeves and dealing with the 3,000 compiler errors in the rest of the code base. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes is hard to do. Yeah. So a build system maybe contributes with that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
Absolutely. That's a scary, that's a scary prospect of like, you know, having to make a change to a P to an interface and not really having confidence that it's correct until you've done an hour's worth of work. Right. Right. Like very often, unfortunately that is the way yeah. of C plus plus where you make the change and then you type make and start <laughs> fixing every single error. You've got one after another one and then you time. go, I hope that was worthwhile. Which, of course, leads to that kind of false dichotomy as well, where having made that change, yeah. if you're on the fence about whether it was worthwhile or not, you're definitely going to say, I'm keeping that. That was an hour of toil. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I'm not undoing it. Yeah. To, to an extent, you know, um, and I, again, I, I, as an IDE-friendly uh, person, I, I'm starting to trust IDEs more and more with some of the refactorings, which I would never have done in C++. And that can be a superpower with some of these changes mm -hmm. because you can say, hey, add a new parameter uh, and you worry about it. Yeah. There's danger that it gets it wrong, of course. But um, And then in which case, undoing that change doesn't feel quite as personal. It doesn't feel like a failure as much when you discover, actually, no, it was not the right thing to <laughs> do. But that's probably a whole other conversation for another time. True. True enough. But yeah, those, those automated refactorings are very powerful. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's I don't know, I, I think that there, we've talked a lot about some of these things sort of being more about philosophy than they are about technique, right? Like if you start with the mm -hmm. philosophy, the tech, you, you know, there's a lot of smart programmers out there doing, doing clever things. If you start with the philosophy, the, the techniques will come, right? You'll either find them um, because you sort of have that desire for them or you'll invent them or you'll borrow them. Um, but whatever it is, like if, if you don't have that buy-in of like, no, we're not going to have the situation where every time I change, you know, my binary search implementation or my binary search, you know, algorithm, that I'm going to just go get a coffee for 30 minutes and then come back later and figure out if anything is, is broken. Right. Like you, right, you, you gotta, right. you gotta design it from the beginning. I mean, this is the the whole. There's an XKCD for this, which tells you how <laughs> endemic and problematic it is in in the industry That's of the, right. the sword fighting. That's exactly right. That's on exactly chairs, right. and I just for the record, no one should really be writing their own binary search. There's an STL implementation <laughs> that is perfectly good, so use that, <laughs> even if it's confusingly named. Just use that, yeah. please. Yeah, all the more reason. Right, and I mean there are so, so yeah. While we're just there are other tricks, of course, um, but. Some of the other tricks that one might use to reduce one's uh, coupling in C++ mm -hmm. do have a runtime impact. Now, I've sort of said about pulling stuff out of headers and, and then relying on link-time code generation to kind of undo that is is one thing because that, that, that essentially nets out net these days, I think. But sometimes you can extract an interface and declare it and define it literally as an interface, like an actual virtual interface thing knowing that everyone who's ever calling you is now going to be cursed to go through a virtual function call to get to your implementation. But now mm -hmm. that acts as this beautiful uh, disconnect, both in terms of the a pure interface, like from a design standpoint, and from the, well, now I can substitute any old object I like, and I've built that separately to you. you it may not have even been from the same build process. It could be from some other thing completely differently. And so I've insulated you from changes to my implementation at the very highest level. And that can be a powerful technique. And then just because I love this stuff so much, and I'm sorry to <laughs> get excited about more compilation trickery, <laughs> even That's that, why we're doing the podcast I is guess... to get excited about this stuff. <laughs> That is a very fair point, mate. Yeah. Uh, but even that, which seems like it's an irredeemable change to the way you've write, written your code and you've put this massive doorstop in between. So I don't know if doorstop's the right thing. You've put this massive uh, uh, barrier for the optimizer between my implementation and your calling through an interface. Compilers are just starting to get clever enough to see through that. Now, in managed languages like Java, um, this kind of trick has been able to be done for a while. Like at, at runtime, as you're calling a virtual method, it kind of goes, hey, you know what? This is always concrete file system. I wonder if I should just call concrete file system directly and then inline it and then put a check. And if it's never, if it's not a concrete file system, then immediately like go, oh, no, we're done here. We have to de-optimize and do something else. But most of the time, as long as it is just a concrete file system, then it's as fast as if I'd written a direct call. Mm-hmm. C++ is starting to pick up on this. There is some devirtualization going into Clang and GCC, and a lot of that stuff is is getting more and more sophisticated. It's not a total panacea, 
yet, but I would imagine that as time ticks on, it will become more and more possible to rely on the compiler doing magic for you. And that way I can write my code with an interface between things to, to separate it both from a testability point of view so I can have my file system and I can have my mock file system and my concrete file system and whatever. And from a build time standpoint, because I very rarely change the interface to my file system, but I probably, if I'm working on the file system, I'm hacking around inside the implementation all the time. And all I'm doing is building and then the linker just has to run. And so there's a lot of good things going on on there and there are if you one doesn't have to use virtual methods to divorce your implementation from your interface there's a technique called pimpl which insulates your callers from the structural layer of your object so if you have like an int and a float as member variables and you decide to add a char later on of course you've changed the size of your object which means anyone who has one of your objects in there has to be rebuilt and all these kinds of things so there are ways and means around those those two but it, that does come with a runtime cost and mm-hmm. that's something you might just have to to take on the chin for certain things and you know again if you iterate fast you can probably find quickly the areas that you're that need the performance so i don't know i'm throwing out ideas really for the for for build time um insulation techniques which is less about the build time itself and about more about reducing the uh the coupling between components so that a small change to an implementation doesn't necessitate a giant rebuild of your program right right and you know the 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 sort of add-on benefits of of doing that beyond just the build time right like the the decoupling that you get otherwise right exactly i was going to say what about um other things like distributed builds and other kind of external tricks for speeding up builds what's your take on those in general so I think they're a necessary evil once you get to some level of complexity. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, uh, the companies I've worked at before, we've had good success with commercial offerings that allow you to distribute your build in a relatively straightforward way. But most of the time, the time and effort in, in getting that to work reliably and not to have misbuilds and not have issues with distributing the particular version of the compiler that you've got or anything like that is... Um, is outweighed by just put just and I say just with little air quotes here <laughs> just putting as fast a computer you can possibly afford in the hands of your developers yeah. for their day-to-day activities so I'm lucky enough to have like a 16 core machine here and so building locally with 16 cores 16 threads of, of a build is fast enough and obviously that's that's great not everyone can afford that not every company is going to shell out for a machine with that amount of of of, of power but mm-hmm. Given the cost to engineers of them twiddling their thumbs, waiting, that is probably the best bang for buck. Otherwise, you're talking about buying in a uh, an external distributed build system or trying to get dist CC or equivalent to work, which is a very good product. But as soon as you're having to worry about which version of the compiler is installed on some other person's machine and making sure that they have the same header files that you do – the the effort of doing that plus the effort of debugging it when it goes wrong is very very high nobody wants to be in the situation where you do the build you run your test they fail in a surprising way and so you blow away everything and rebuild only to discover that it it, it was actually a genuine problem and you just wasted the time because you didn't trust your build yeah and this is i know you know this but i'm very passionate about <laughs> being able to trust the reliability of your builds yeah and yeah so I've, I've heard so you I, rail before about you should never maybe never is a strong word but you should be careful about <laughs> using make clean. That's yeah you were right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> if you type make clean uh then yeah you all all bets are off. No. My my particular case in that is I have seen it when people have builds that are not reproducible when people have builds that are flaky in some way often to do with parallel builds because they haven't either specified their build properly or they have a step that is not parallelizable and doesn't say that it isn't. And so it's non-deterministic. Um, then what tends to happen is that any sort of weird, unexpected behavior in the program, either like a weird crash or um, a test that fails unusually, that you can get into the situation where the knee-jerk response is, well, maybe it was a bad build. And then you do make clean and then you run it again, and maybe it works. And then there are two reasons for this 
The first reason is that your build was indeed buggy and broken and you were in an indeterminate state. And my strong belief is that you should fix your build. And the only way really to fix your build is to look at the sort of the carcass, pick over it and try and understand from all the files that you have what the heck happened. And if you right. just type make clean, you got rid of that. So yeah, you've it's lost like trying to solve of... a crime by cleaning up the crime scene. Like, oh, I get rid of this blood. <laughs> These fingerprints are all messy. I can fix that. All right. No more murders. Right. Murder <laughs> solved. <laughs> Nothing to see here, folks. That's kind of the good case, in a yeah. way, because make, clean, make, and it starts working again. You're like, oh, okay, I had a bad bill. But you won't ever be able to fix it if you if you take that approach. The second thing is that maybe you do actually have a genuine one in a million bug in your code like it's a race condition mm -hmm. or it's a strange um, case that happened, like the network drive was, was down temporarily, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. unusual circumstances, in which case you have chalked it up to and maybe missed the one opportunity to debug and dig into mm -hmm. a, a freak occurrence. Yeah. And so now you just do make, clean, make, and it goes away and then you don't trust your build and you've lost the opportunity. And so I, th this is why I feel so strongly about this kind of stuff, as yeah. you can tell. And to bring it back onto the, the subject, because I know this is a thing you can wind me up for, for hours on, <laughs> is, um, you know, obviously adding distribution into your build system adds yet another reason for your build system to be non-deterministic or to be broken in some way or right. to have issues um and so if you give everyone people another excuse to kind of go oh i don't really know what that problem was i fancy another cup of coffee make clean make and then walk away from their computer for a bit then i yeah. think that's a bad direction to go in exactly. but i understand that i have strong opinions about this no i mean and i it's funny because i share your opinions in, an, in a few other forms one of you know staying on brand here obviously uh, uh testing of course. Uh, of course you knew I was going to say that. Distributed test systems, right? Like whole industries were built trying to figure out how to get oh. Ruby on Rails apps to run their tests in a performant manner once they had, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of them because each one took like a second, right? Because active record. So like, you know, oh, we'll run them in parallel, right? And it's like you're solving the wrong problem when you do <laughs> that, right? You're, you're introducing a whole other form of unreliability into your tests in the name of speeding up your your feedback loop, which is, you know, you sh like they're feeling the pain and they should try to speed up those feedback loops. But the way to do that is, you know, there are certain situations in which the best that you can do is try to, to run it in parallel, but you have to recognize that when you do that, you're creating a whole other kind of unreliable failure that you're then also just going to have to deal with. Right. Um, and certainly in the, the, you know, the world of make clean, I feel like there are two kinds of developers in the world the the kind where you know when you turn it off or turn it and turn it back on again or reset it or do whatever the thing is to make the bug go away they're happy and then the other kind where they're disappointed right like <laughs> what i wanted to see is when you reloaded that page that the bug happened again how many times have you had to tell a, a family member to turn off a system and turn it back on again and then hated yourself so much because it's <laughs> it, it's the only solution available but yeah you're you're so right yeah. you're so right yeah yeah like you you those opportunities are sometimes the next time you're going to get that is in production when there's like serious stuff on the line. Yeah. And so all those opportunities to try to figure out what's going on with these things, like the worst thing is bugs that, that only happen one in a thousand times, right? Because they're so hard to fix. Yeah. Um, if you're not interested in fixing them, it's great because, okay, I got 999 <laughs> more times left before I need to worry about this again. But uh, if you actually want to solve the problem, it's the, you really want it to be reproducible. So the the only way to fix that sort of intermittent failure is to really just kill it with fire. Every opportunity, it's the you first opportunity you, you get, exactly. And I think you and I have talked yeah. about this kind of stuff: failing early, failing fast, and not doing mm -hmm. things occasionally if you can avoid it. You know, in in our world of yeah. finance, there are some sort of things that one does when one is uh, receiving uh, market data from the outside world, and there is a good case and there's a bad case. And if you can engineer it so you always start off with the bad case, then you'll never be surprised when <laughs> the peak of market activity, yep. you have to do the same uh, thing. And similarly, like, like I remember that when the Linux kernel, they fixed a bug in the way the rollover worked in, in a timer. Like there was a... Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And so nowadays, um, they, they fudge the timer so it starts up with like a two, 10 minutes before it overflows. Just to force mm -hmm, it to happen mm -hmm. like early at the time and not like four years, 55 days into the uptime of a machine, which I think is, you know, it's a pragmatic solution. Just to like, okay, you boot it up. Yeah. Get to see whether it works every time now rather than it happening yep. once, literally, well, 
not even a blue moon. I think that's yeah. every three months, something like that. Either it's going to work or it's going to not. If you can put it in a situation where if it's broken, it will fail, that is always better. Right, fail that's early. That's always better. Yeah. Yeah, fail if early. If you're going to fail at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's... Uh, I mean, there's tons of more to talk about this, but oh, this is so a really good spot for topic, us to, to we stop. We can only go for so long. I know, that's right. But our poor listeners can only tolerate us blabbering on for so long too but <laughs> next time we can talk about some more uh, C++ stuff or we can we can go into other languages or maybe a whole other topic who knows but it's been great yeah, fun talking about it I'm, 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 I'm glad you riled me up on the make clean stuff <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully ready to go out and make you know some some strong statements about things which is very uncharacteristic for me but so yeah alright that's good I guess I'll see you next time next time You've been listening to Two's Compliment, a programming podcast by Ben Rady and Matt Godbold. Find the show transcript and notes at twoscompliment.org. Contact us on Twitter at 2CP, that's at T-W-O-S-C-P. Theme music by Inverse Phase, inversephase.com. <laughs>